Irene Malati, and Amanda is our coordinator, so you should all know her because anybody in this room who has a specific need, for instance, they don't hear about an appointment or uh, they have a question, Amanda is very happy to help with that. I'd like to start the morning by introducing Dr. Michael Oaken. Many of you may know Dr. Oaken. He directs the Movement Disorder Center here, and he's going to welcome you all, and we have a nice little program organized for you this morning. At the end, we did things a little different this year, and we saved a good chunk of time to answer questions. So besides just giving talks, we're going to have a, a, a point at the end that we just have an Ask the Doctor panel. And sometimes you may be shy to ask a particular question, so we have this paper passed around where you can jot down a question. Uh, you don't have to, but you're welcome to. And we'll collect those and answer your questions at the end. Um, just as a Everybody can come the ways that they want, um, but uh, the presenters will be here in the PowerPoint presentation. So Amanda points out that we have two screens for the presentations. You're welcome to move this way. You certainly don't have to. Sit wherever you're comfortable. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody up? Well, welcome to the symposium. This is our ninth uh, straight symposium. Next year will be the the 10th anniversary of the center and it, it's really um, grown over the years and it, it's been a real honor to be part of this and we consider this to be your center not our center so it belongs to the patients and and we we believe strongly that that you're the drivers. You drive the care you drive the research, you drive the outreach, you drive the future, and so, so that's um, how we've designed things. I want to tell you a little bit um, about um, some exciting new things that have happened uh, here at the University of Florida. And the most exciting thing is, is that last week we opened uh, the new Center for Movement Disorders and Neurorestoration. And so we've rebranded ourselves and opened in a single location. It's on 34th Street, and this is in the Orthopedics and Sports Medicine building. And it's on the fourth floor. And this is a, a paradigm shift. This is a shift for how we deliver health care. This is changing the orbit of the American healthcare system. Normally, the physician is at the center of the orbit. We've never believed that. We believe the patient is at the center, and we should all revolve around the patient, okay? So when it comes to Parkinson's disease, the patient is in the center, all the clinicians, all the researchers should revolve around the patient. And so, so this, is, uh, this is the concept, and this is how um, the center is designed. It has 10,000 um, dedicated square feet to it, and I'm gonna show you a little bit uh, about how it works. Uh, we also have an opening event that's on May 25th, and Marie Daniels is out in front. There's a little desk, and you can register for the opening event, and we hope that you come. Muhammad Ali's daughter is going to be the headliner, as well as several other uh, guest speakers for the opening event. And so we want to invite you and, uh, and make sure that uh, you know about it and, and raise the awareness of Parkinson's disease and also raise the awareness of this center as a model for Parkinson's disease care. So uh, this is our new sign. Uh, it turns out that our name is too long to fit on the sign. Now we're the Center for Movement Disorders and Neuro Restoration, so we're going to have to trim those bushes down if we're going to get the, the last word in there. But, uh, but you'll see this, and it's really easy to get to if you're driving on Interstate 75. You can get off uh, at either Newberry Road or on Archer Road, and you just head down to 34th Street, and it's halfway between the two exits on 34th Street. It's very convenient. The um, University of Florida Conference Center Hotel is right there. So the idea is, is it's an international destination. It's a destination where you can stay at the hotel, you can come across the street and get your care and get all the disciplines potentially in a single day. This is the ribbon cutting from last Monday. Uh, we were honored to have former Attorney General Janet Reno, who has Parkinson's disease, and she took the first patient-centric tour of the center, and, uh, and she saw all the disciplines, and so she was the first patient, and now we invite all the, all the patients to come and participate. 
This is the check-in area, and you can see Dr. Ashizawa, the Brain Institute Director, Dr. Foote, the co-director of the center, is on the left, Dr. Ashizawa in the middle, and Dr. Friedman, the, the Director of Neurosurgery. And the idea is this is completely interdisciplinary. Everybody's given up their, their fiefdoms and their kingdoms and said we're going to come together for the best care and best research for the patients. So when you get off the elevator, you'll see this beautiful, very open uh, area. You can get on the website. There's a single check-in form for all specialties, so you fill it out once. You don't keep filling it out every time you need to see somebody. You check in there at the front, and what happens to you is that then you enter the patient-centered experience. We have an automated uh, gait strip, gait and balance strip, to check your gait and balance on each of the visits to make sure we're preventing falls and also uh, advancing the, the, the research in that area. And so it's a simple thing. It takes about 60 seconds, and we get a nice readout on how your feet are doing and operating and your clinician gets that and your physical therapist gets that and your, everybody gets that that touches you on the visit. You then proceed on into our waiting room that has a uh, an immersive display in it that, that moves very slowly. It has these, these wonderful images. We hope that you don't sit in the waiting room very long, but the time that you do sit in the waiting room, you'll see the, the, um, the pictures there show our Dance for Life program, and then this immersive display. is It's a really nice uh, uh, thing for patients. Um, they have not taught us yet how to flip it so we can watch NFL football and Major League Baseball on this, but but it's a, it's a tremendous display and, and, and tremendously nice. For new patients or existing patients, you can now go to the website and uh, get a complete introduction to the center by video. Our new patients come in and watch this 10-minute video. This is Carl Sandberg. He, he's a patient with Parkinson. He's the voice of the Movement Disorder Center. He has a wonderful, wonderful voice. He tells the story of the center. He tells you everything that's going to happen to you on your visit. Here's Amanda Eilers. How it works as you go through the different special and so it's a, it's a great little introduction. It's designed to be just like in the national park system. I like to go to the national parks and, uh, and see all these great things all over the country. And you know what they do. They have this little video that tells you what you're going to see. You sit down, you watch the video, and then you're prepared to see the park. It's the same thing at the, at the center. All of the rooms are, uh, are completely designed for the patients. The patients have all the windows, so you have all the great views. There's very few offices. Dr. Foote and I don't even have our own office. People are sharing space to make sure there's plenty of space for the patients, plenty of space for all the specialists in the center. You can see Janet Reno going around. This is the room in the corner that has tons of, of windows on it, and Dr. Foote's telling Janet Reno this would make a great president and CEO office, but the patients get that room. Not the, uh, not the physicians and, and not the administrators. And so you can see an interdisciplinary team from surgery and from anesthesia standing there. And we have an interdisciplinary team from neurology, neurosurgery, neuropsychology, speech, social work, PTOT, the whole thing. And the idea is, is they're all in this space. So you go to one place and then we orbit around you. And so it's a, it's a great, great concept. You can see here's Nick McFarlane, one of our uh, newest neurologists who joined the practice examining a patient. You can see the views that you see out, out of these windows. All of the art on the walls is designed by patients. We've had a request for art up for the last year and we'll continue to do this. And we have a committee that reviews these requests as they come in. The art that comes in, especially from the Parkinson disease patients, is outstanding. Unbelievable. I don't know what it is about you guys. You're very creative. We give you dopamine. We give you DBS. You get even more creative. And the artwork is just tremendous. And um, I invite you to see it. The artists, if you make it through the, uh, through the committee and the competition and you can, you can put your, your art in, it is judged by professional artists, you know, which ones get on the wall. But if you're fortunate enough to get on the wall, you also get a placard with your, with your name on and acknowledging it. The center is uh, designed uh, so that everything is patient-centric. Even the tables move, so it doesn't look like you're talking to a computer screen. And the monitors move, so you can see the monitor and you can see what's on the monitor. You can see another piece of art here. This is the daughter of a patient who, who has a beautiful piece of art that says you are not your disease, which I think is, is, is really inspirational. So you'll go through all those disciplines. There's also a full physical 
therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy suite here so you can get everything potentially in a single visit. And we want patients to have access to rehab services and it's really important for the complete care. The building has an MRI scanner. It has the ability to do swallow studies. So, so you can get all of the things that you need to get in the same place. And I, I think that's really the way that we should be delivering health care. This is our training room. So we have a room that's dedicated for trainees that come from all over the world, from the United States and from the world. And this is uh, actually, um, this space was uh, donated to us by the Smallwood Foundation and we call it the Smallwood Commons. And so we wanna train the future generation of, of movement disorders and other specialty uh, areas uh, to make them experts and to disseminate them and export them throughout the world. This is the Clinical Trials Coordination Center. And so as you're walking around, you get to the training, you get to the education. There's the database room that I skipped and the telemedicine room so we can connect you know, to the different support groups all over and also begin to see patients through telemedicine if you are from too far of a distance. But the last room is the Clinical Trials Coordination Center and that's where the hope is. We hope to get everything into the trials area so that we can bring those therapies forward for the patients. And the, so there's seven coordinators under Dr. Ramon Rodriguez that, that run this, this area. And so I think it's great. I think that the people are fantastic. You can see the group has grown from three of us to uh, many, many more. And uh, we want to make sure that we're taking care of your needs. And so, um, so with that, I'll remind you, come to our opening event. If you want to register, Marie Daniels is out there in front. She'll get you registered. She has a little computer and flyers and things like that. Um, it's on May 25th, and we look forward to seeing you all in the center and showing you around, and you need to tell us what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong so we can make this a, a great experience. So, uh, so thanks, and we want to acknowledge the Stockdale uh, Foundation. Is Sally Muller here? Are you here? So she'll be here at some point this morning, and, and, um, and the Stockdale um, Foundation is what's paying for your experience today, and so they wanted to make sure that this, this event happens every year for the Parkinson patients. So thank you very much. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Uh, Nicholas McFarland, and I'm just going to embarrass Nick a little bit. He's uh, joined our faculty um, just uh, recently here, but, but soon he'll be on a year before he blinks. Uh, he came to us from Massachusetts General Hospital, um, a little, uh, little hospital in Boston that uh, most people know associated with Harvard. And, um, and he has uh, developed a, a research laboratory and has National Institutes of Health funding to study the neurodegenerative disease process and has also put together an interdisciplinary program for the treatment of Parkinson and Parkinsonism. And we're very lucky to have him as part of the center and he's gonna to talk to you today. Nick. All right, well, thank you for all of you coming here and spending this morning with us. And I want to extend my uh, welcome to everybody who's here. And uh, um, I hope I have a good little program for you all. Uh, first of all, I guess I'll just say I'm, I'm actually really a Midwesterner, so that's the little secret here. So, um, And I made my way sort of by a roundabout way up uh, going north and then up to Boston and then finally down here. And sort of the secret really is that uh, um, uh, Dr. Oaken sort of recruited me down here and uh, it really wasn't that hard um, to get me to come down here once I saw this place and all the excitement and the energy that was here and the fact that they were really putting together a huge program um, to take care of patients in a real holistic way as well as to sort of really push forward research uh, for Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism. So the two together really is going to be powerful to uh, find a way to make sort of help us beat this disorder. Uh, so. With that said, you know, I have a, I was thinking about putting together a talk and kind of putting a lot of gratuitous stuff in here about my family and all. We really enjoyed being here and uh, you know, looking outside. Uh, we'd be kind of looking at a very cold uh, uh, spring, barely at this point in Boston, but we're really enjoying a great uh, day this, mor this morning. So I hope we'll get you guys out by sort of mid after early afternoon here so you can enjoy the rest of this beautiful day today. So what I have put together here for you all today is sort of a talk on Parkinson's, Parkinsonisms and sort of frontiers because really what I do in my work actually is sort of bridging that. So I spend about uh, 
majority of my time actually in a basic laboratory in which we do translational research, so trying to find those answers as to why we get Parkinson's, Parkinsonisms and how we can try to treat them better, um, eventually find what we call a cure at least, or at least a better treatment. Um, and the rest of the time I spend in the clinic and I see you guys at least once a week in our clinic. So I kind of bridge that and that's so sort of my role here. So uh, with that said, let me push forward and show you what I have to tell you about today. If I can figure out, there you go. So I'm going to start out with a couple of basic slides and then we'll move forward to some of the different Parkinsonism. Now, what I'll mention it up front really is uh, just by way of introduction for you all, I think you all have, many of you have Parkinson's disease, but I'll just mention just briefly here some of the criteria that we use to diagnose patients with. When we talk about Parkinsonism, I know this gets confused a lot. So what's Parkinsonism, what's Parkinson's disease? Well, so Parkinsonism really is, Basically, I use an acronym TRAP for tremor, rigidity, slowing of movement, or bradykinesia. We call that, that's just a fancy term, or akinesia for lack of movement, as well as postural sensibility. And there are obviously other features that are part of Parkinsonism. But you need at least two out of four of those, top four on that list, um, to sort of classify you as Parkinsonism. Now, again, just to emphasize, Parkinsonism really is just a descriptive term for a broad range of disorders, okay? Now, among that, really, Parkinson's disease is probably the most common form of Parkinsonism. I think all of you know that. However, now a certain percentage of folks come in with what we call atypical Parkinson's symptoms. Now, uh, the, I'll tell you that the American Academy of Neurology has pushed forward uh, new uh, sort of guidelines for us to uh, look over patients again on a yearly uh, basis just to be sure again that pa patients with Parkinson's disease diagnosis um, really do have Parkinson's disease or not some sort of atypical disorder. Since there's a difference, uh, and I'll go over some of those differences for you today, I think that might be of interest to all of you. Um, so we will be doing that and we do that often. Yes. Are you sure? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So, better for all of you in the back? Great. So, what I'm going to talk about a little bit about the atypical Parkinsonism, and basically, there's another name for that that's Parkinson's plus type disorders, meaning they have additional types of symptoms that are not typical. We've also started to classify some of these disorders based on the pathology that they have. And I'll just sort of allude initially here that we are talking a little bit about proteins that abnormally are found in the brain pathologically, and we start to call these as proteinopathies. And some of these you may have actually heard of, amyloid in terms of Alzheimer's disease, synuclein in terms of Parkinson's, and I'm going to go back over this. Then there's taus and ubiquitins. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about these. So, second here. So, Again, really, Parkinson's disease is really the most common of these, and of course, you all know many of the symptoms. Additional things, of course, that we see in Parkinson's patients really are the loss of facial expression, sort of sometimes looks like staring. You get that tremor, usually it's a resting tremor, not always, the stiffness, rigidity, the stoop posture that you see in this gentleman, shown here in the picture on the right, as well as the slowed gait and the shuffling that you see as well. Now, I'll emphasize, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today, that Parkinson's disease, as well as many of these Parkinsonisms, not just a motor disorder. In fact, there are many other non-motor symptoms that we are recognizing more and more these days, and these include things like autonomic dysfunction. What do I mean by autonomic? Well, what I mean by autonomic are those automatic things you guys don't think about you're doing. What does your brain do? Your brain controls your blood pressure, controls your heart rate, controls sweating, breathing, things you don't think about all the time. These are some of the things that could also be affected by Parkinson's disease as well, and I'll cover some of that. Also, some of you also complain of sensory disturbance, so we all think of this as a motor disorder. Sensory symptoms include things like numbness, tingling, and even pain in Parkinson's disease, which can be very significant and disabling as well. And then cognitive decline, I think we all sort of associate Parkinson's not necessarily initially with cognitive changes, but we do recognize more and more that people do have difficulty doing things um, at home. Um, driving can also be a problem. And additionally, there is some forgetfulness. So there are some cognitive symptoms that develop usually later on. And I'll talk a little bit about those more with regard to the other Parkinsonisms as well, because that can be really important. So a little bit about the Parkinson pathologies. I told you I'm going to sort of bridge the gap here between the research and the actual clinical. So 
what do we see in Parkinson's disease? Many of you probably know the hallmark of this disorder really is the loss of a set of dopamine cells in the brain. These reside in the brain stem. And up on the right hand corner, let's see if I have a, a little, you can hardly see that, but on the left hand side, this is a normal brain and you can see what are called these pigmented neurons. They're dark brown colored. On the right hand side, this is a normal brain. This is a Parkinson's brain where you see loss of those pigmented neurons shown here. So that's one of the major hallmarks and the reason why we use dopamine drugs like levodopa, specifically in Parkinson's. In addition to that, we also see pathologically what are called Lewy bodies in the brain. These are pathological inclusions that we see in cells. They're these little round things you see here on the, in the cell shown here. And this is just a stain for specific protein in those Lewy bodies. So these are proteinaceous inclusions that we see that are not normal and they reside in cells pathologically. So I'll come back and back to this because actually it turns out that many disorders, not just Parkinson's disease, also have these proteinaceous inclusions in them and maybe sort of a clue as to how maybe we can attack these disorders and why these cells possibly die. A few of those other disorders I'll talk about today are multiple system atrophy, Lewy body dementia, and even there are familial or genetic forms of Parkinsonism that have some of these pathological inclusions too. So that said, really, I should come back to genes. Now, what causes Parkinson's disease? Well, we now know that probably there's a combination of environmental factors and genes. Now, it used to be said that this is just a sporadic disorder. Well, I give you a little short list here. I don't expect you all to memorize it, but basically the point here really is that there are now 15 different genes that are associated with familial forms of Parkinson's disease. That said, of course, this is still quite rare. Less than 1% of you are probably <clears throat> someone who has a familial form of Parkinsonism. However, in addition to this, we know that there are several genes that provide susceptibility for Parkinsonism and that if you have Parkinson's disease, there is an increased chance if you are, have a, a primary relative of getting the disorder um, compared to others. So there is a genetic form here. And in fact, this is what we're studying, what these genes do in Parkinsonism. Now, let me move forward and talk about sort of Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism. When is it something other than Parkinson's disease? So that's a question that we have to ask ourselves all the time. And so when we're looking at you guys in, the, in our clinics, these are some of the features that we think about. And some of these are the atypical features. These are what we call negative predictors of Parkinson's disease. Those include things like lack of tremor or absence of tremor. Although most patients who have Parkinson's disease do get tremor, there is a small percentage who don't. So lack of tremor is something that raises a little bit of a red flag. Early gait problems and falling, so falls within the first several months of getting the disorder, that would be abnormal for us. Um, frequent falls, uh, freezing, these are some of the things that we think about as well. Pyramidal tract signs, this really has to do with stiffness um, and specific symptoms that we see on exam. Um, and then the last thing I've listed on here is the response to typical Parkinson's disease drugs, response to levodopa in particular. That's our sort of gold standard drug that we talk about. Most of you get a really good response, but lack of response can sort of raise a little bit of a red flag for us. I list here a short number, roughly 75% of people do respond. So when they do respond, we often use this as a positive predictor that you have regular Parkinson's disease, but if not, that's one of the things we look at. So I mentioned or alluded to about the plus features of Parkinson's disease before. So here are some of those plus features that I talk, sort of alluding at. These things hint towards different types of disorders, hence the plus part. So eye movement abnormalities. If you see those, I list on the right hand side some disorders that actually associate with that. PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy is hinted by that disorder. Sometimes we see we call uh, marked dysautonomia, la, la, so those automatic symptoms as well as ataxia or clumsiness, which can suggest a different disorder called multiple system atrophy, strider, which is a breathing difficulty <gasps> that people see, sort of a <gasps> uh, type of breathing that can occur sometimes at night, sometimes during the daytime, can suggest another disorder. Lack of learned behaviors or jerking movements, and even what we call an alien limb type syndrome. Off this here, I've listed as an alien hand, can suggest something called cortical basal syndrome. And then 
I list on here dystonia. Now, Parkinson's disease can certainly be associated with dystonia, but if it's really a marked feature and only on one side, sometimes we, that can be a red flag for us as well and is considered to be a plus feature too. And then lastly, I put on here dementia. So, as I said already, cognitive decline can be a feature of Parkinson's, but early on actually suggests a different disorder. Sometimes we call Lewy body dementia or LBD versus what I call Parkinson's disease with dementia, which really occurs much, much, much later on, so 10, 20 years within the disease sometimes. So let me just talk about that disorder just briefly. So Lewy body dementia really is, looks very much like Parkinson's disease. However, the dementia or the cognitive decline occurs early on, sometimes with the onset of Parkinson's symptoms, and at least for a research sort of diagnosis, we'd say within the first year of symptom onset. In addition, patients can sometimes have hallucinations or even frank delusion. Um, so these are some things that we see in disorders, and sometimes even in Parkinson's disease late on, these could be complications, sometimes complications of therapy. So there's a gray zone here, but uh, clearly these are some red flags that can raise a question as to, is this Lewy body dementia and not Parkinson's disease? Now, I'll also point out here, because it's called Lewy body dementia, we also see those characteristic protein deposits pathologically. So there are some common themes shown here. Now, another one of those disorders that shares the same or similar pathology, again, having Lewy bodies pathology, is something called multiple system atrophy. Now, this is basically another plus disorder, Parkinsonism plus severe autonomic failure or failure of those automatic things like blood pressure. It comes in three flavors. I list three of them. Really, this, the top one called Scheidrager is primarily a syndrome where you have autonomic failure. These folks really have problems a lot with what we call orthostatic symptoms where they stand up, their blood pressure drops out, and sometimes people faint. And that can be very significant problem. In addition, they can have problems with impotence, urinary function, severe constipation, but they also have Parkinsonism. And that's one flavor. Stridonigal degeneration is one in which we have predominant Parkinsonism with autonomic symptoms. And patients generally don't respond very well to the typical Parkinson's medications. And lastly, the last flavor is one in which you do have both of those symptoms, but really the differentiating feature is the clumsiness when people have falls and difficulty doing fighter motor tasks. So we actually call that olivopontocerebellar atrophy. The name really, long name, basically just explains which brain areas show shrinkage or atrophy specifically and relates to the pathology and the disorder. So again, I mentioned that this has a shared pathology, those Lewy bodies. Interestingly enough, they have the same type of pertinacious inclusions in the cells, but these actually are found not in the neurons, but actually in the supporting cells in the brain itself. So shared pathology, protein inclusions. So I'm going to point that out again. Now, probably the most common form of, we call the Parkinson's plus or atypical Parkinson's is actually progressive supranuclear palsy. Now, the hallmark of this one is really the early falls. So early falls, um, and I show kind of a little bit of data here on the right-hand slide. So with Parkinson's disease, on average, and this was a study done several years ago, suggests that Parkinson's patients generally, on average, within about 100 to 8 uh, months of onset of disease, start having falls and gait problems. That's fairly late. Now look at what's called PSP, or progressive supranuclear palsy. The average onset of falls occurs within the first 15 to 20 months, so significantly earlier. So that raises a red flag for us. These patients also have problems with slurred speech, swallowing problems, and eye movement issues are particularly problematic as well. There are a lot of other features that I list over here, the slowing, sloppy habits, um, pseudo-bulbar affect. Let me take just a second to explain what that is. Really, um, the best way to explain it is we call labile emotions, going from laughing to crying um, without any reason at all. Um, so that can be very disconcerting for many folks, both patients and family members, and something that we can try to treat directly, actually. The dementia also is a feature here, again, as I mentioned, with Parkinson's disease, not that typical early on, probably more progressive in this disorder. So let's talk a little about pathology again. So this is not a Lewy body disorder. 
this actually has another protein that plays a role, and that protein is actually called tau. So I'll raise it up to you just so, again, you hear that thing about proteins and protein inclusions. Actually, these proteins form glops within cells as well. They even sh show what we call tangles. Neurofibrillary tangles are interesting because they're actually seen also in Alzheimer's disease as well. So there may be, again, a shared pathology. Um, there is also shrinkage of the brain, in particular in the brain stem. This is just a picture of an MRI. This is a Parkinson's patient with the brain stem. This is the top of the brain stem up top. And what you can see in PSP, there's the shrinkage of the midbrain, whereas in the multiple system actually there's shrinkage of this portion of the brain as well. So there are some differences, and we can use things like brain scans to, to detect some of these things. Uh, so we do now have some useful things that we can do to figure out what you actually have. So I'll take just a second here to say that, you know, even though these disorders don't necessarily respond as well to the, the typical Parkinson's medications, we do have a lot of things that we can do for these patients. It's not at all hopeless. We do have supportive care that's extremely important that you're going to hear from, from our superb uh, therapy team today. Um, so this is things like physical therapy that helps with fall prevention. Um, it's very important to swallow studies to prevent uh, having aspiration and then uh, to help uh, treat some of those symptoms, we can also use specific medications. Uh, I'll list a couple other things that are down here, the dementia. There's some role for some of the Alzheimer's medications that uh, we can use. And then with the pseudobulbar, or pseudobulbar affect or the emotional ability, we have specific drugs, particularly actually a cough serum, the drug that's found frequently in cough serum, dextromethorphan, that we can use specifically treat these patients. So there are definitely things that we can do, and that's really why I emphasize it's important for us to identify folks with Parkinson's versus these types of Parkinsonisms. So um, lastly, I want to just show something called cortical basal degeneration. This is a relatively rare form of those Parkinson's plus disorders. Um, the difference really here is that symptoms often are typically marked more on one side than another. Now, with Parkinson's disease, we always or very typically see asymmetric onset of symptoms. One side is typically more effective than the other. In this, I think patients often take it kind of to a, a, another nth degree. Um, their symptoms can be more marked. They get a, more of a coarse tremor. Sometimes they can get abnormal posturing or what we call dystonia. Um, they can get jerking movements. They get this alien limb phenomenon, a limb that sort of moves without their control or knowledge of it, um, which is often kind of disconcerting and strange. Um, they also get cognitive problems, particularly sometimes language, depending on which side of the brain is affected. And then they have some gait problems, but later on the disease. One thing I do want to point out again is this is another, like PSP, a tau disorder. Sorry, this pointer is not working as well. But they also get these protein inclusions. So again, common themes here. So all that information is kind of leading up to this. These common themes kind of lead to this protein inclusions are seen in all of these neurodegenerative diseases. So I mentioned Alzheimer's briefly, didn't show you slides on it, but Alzheimer's has these amyloid plaques. Alpha-synuclein is what's found in the Lewy bodies and seen in Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia, multiple system atrophy, tau disorders, I mentioned the progressive supranuclear palsy, CBD or cortical basal. There are other ones, frontotemporal dementia, if those are interested. And there are other proteins that are seen as well, even prion disease shown here. So common themes, really. So what are we things going on here? And I think actually this is really important because it goes to really how are we going to prevent those brain cells from dying and probably make you better. Or even if we can, prevent the disease from progressing. So this is part of the research that I do um, and some that others have, and this is a model that a lot of people have put together, um, just short of unifying everything here. We believe that proteins, and if I could point to it, on the left-hand side of the slide reside as sort of single proteins. And what's probably going on is that these proteins misfold either by genetic factors um, or even we call it epigenetic factors, meaning sort of how proteins get sugar-coated or get phosphorylated. So there are a lot of different mechanisms that go on there. The cells have ways of actually chaperoning these proteins around and making sure they don't misfold and, in fact, getting rid of them. On the bottom part of the slide are actually are things that are called the proteasome lysosome. These are pathways in which they get rid of garbage proteins. Some cells have difficulty doing that. 
And what happens when you go from the right hand slide of this slide or left hand side of this slide to the right hand slide is these abnormal proteins sometimes come together, they form fibrils, and then they form larger glops, and then eventually they form these protein inclusions called Lewy bodies in this particular case, but also possibly the same thing occurs with tau and tau opets and other things. So why do I go over this? Well, because we're working on drugs and even genetic things that we can, or molecular things that we can do to modify this pathway to prevent these things from happening. Because what's happening here is actually turns out to be toxic to cells, and that's why we probably think we lose some of those dopamine cells in Parkinson's disease. So it's a unifying model because actually, as I showed you, with all these disorders, we see the same proteinaceous inclusions. So I think if we can understand this better, we can just crack one of these disorders. We can probably crack all of them. So we're really working hard on this and finding ways that we can attack this on many different levels, both at the level of genes, the level of proteins, um, a lot of other factors, environmental factors. We know that there are toxins out there that affect this pathway as well. So there are a number of different ways we're trying to attack this. So um, let me just show you one way that we're looking at this actually. Um, this is just a slide from sort of the research that I do as well. Um, on the left hand side there's a picture, picture sort of these orange cells. Well, those are actually the dopamine cells labeled orange in a brain. Now. We can actually overexpress one of those pathological proteins called alpha-synuclein in the brain. And the way we do that is actually using a viral mechanism. And you can see green shown here. That's overexpression of synuclein in those dopamine cells, and you can see them on the top of each other. This is a powerful technique in our research lab for us to study the mechanisms of this molecular pathway. And this is where we're going. So a lot of different frontiers that are going on. This is where I wanted to sort of uh, end up on my talk here today for you all. Hopefully provide a little bit of hope as to where we're going with things. Um, we do now understand that we have this protein apathies going on in the brains and that we can try to attack it at different levels. Um, there has been a lot of talk of different ways of treating Parkinson's disease. One initially was fetal grafts and I think uh, probably you, some of you heard of if you want to ask questions at the end. I will say that they did seem to help some patients, but patients develop dyskinesias. Some of you probably know that as the involuntary motor problems. One other thing that you may not have known is that there were three studies published roughly around the same time suggested that these fetal grafts, when they were put in the brain, actually, after they were able to look at patients about 15 years later, pathologically, they found that the grafts had the same pathology that the Parkinson's patients had. So a little bit disappointing but it actually was a really important finding. It suggested that the pathology was able to spread from the Parkinson's patients to the, what we thought were healthy fetal grafts. Why is that? We're not entirely clear, but it relates to this protein called synuclein, and we're looking more closely as to how that happens. Now, with that said, there is this folks, a couple of researchers named Brock and Brock that came up with a hypothesis suggesting that actually some of the pathology in brains, both in Parkinson's disease and even Lewy body dementia, probably is spreading. So I'll just present this briefly here. Um, with Parkinson's disease, one theory, this is just a theory, really is that you know, some environmental factors can actually cause problems first arriving in the gut, which suggests that the gut is actually innervated by uh, the brain itself that that pathology actually spreads to the brainstem and then rises up in the brainstem up to the area of the brain that's affected in Parkinson's disease. And then eventually over many, many years can spread to the rest of the brain. So it's sort of a bottom-up approach to spreading pathology. So these two hypotheses sort of fit with what was found with the fetal grafts as well. The other half of this was really with Lewy body dementia. I mentioned that the cognitive problem occurs earlier on, well, that's more of a top-down approach. So the reason the higher cortical areas of the brain are affected first versus the brainstem, but eventually it kind of gets down to the brainstem, so a top-down approach. So there are these theories about spreading pathology. So what are we doing about it? We're using things like gene therapy to look at this. And there are a lot of different questions that we have. 
Um, first of all, how do we do gene therapy? Uh, right now, uh, we work closely with a number of folks. I could list a few people, myself, uh, Dr. Ron Mandel, Dr. Nick Mazuska here at the University of Florida who work with uh, viruses to do targeted therapy. Viruses are really very interesting. We actually use the cold virus, common cold virus. It's inactivated, it doesn't, it's not pathological. So that's the good news there. Won't get, cause the common cold anymore, but we can use the, the common cold virus to get things into the brain and to actually express specific molecules that may actually prevent these processes. So the biggest question now really is what part of the brain do we target? So those are remaining questions. Right now we're targeting the cells specifically affected by Parkinson's disease. We're not sure if that's the answer. And the other questions really are what genes should we target and, where, and what it really is our goal. Well, our goal obviously is to make people better. One of our other goals is to prevent disease or prevent degeneration of those brain cells ultimately. And then lastly, really what we're using this for in our uh, research really is to model disease, which is extremely important. We have really no good models of some of these Parkinsonisms. And as I said, I'll say it again really, if we can crack one of them, we hope we can crack all of them. So um, other things that we're looking into are those pesky dyskinesias. There are new treatments out there. Um, we hope we'll be more effective for helping folks with that. Um, and then I'm sure some of you have probably heard of biomarkers. Um, it's frustrating for us in clinic, and I'm sure for many of you, is to hear that this is largely a clinical diagnosis and we have no way of doing a blood test or a brain scan to say whether you have Parkinson's or not. That's not entirely true. There are some researchers out there that are doing things. Uh, but we are working actively here at the University of Florida to hopefully bring these biomarker studies here. And that would mean probably looking at blood tests, possibly spinal fluid, um, maybe even looking at skin cells or even uh, things from uh, inside of your mouth to look at different markers in cells that may tell you us what kind of diseases you all have and to confirm things like Parkinson's and even detect it early on. And if we could follow whether some of our treatments are actually making a difference, this would be a big boon for all of us. So um, I will say also, and I'll kind of give uh, Dr. Oaken and his team kind of a big kudos, uh, we're working also with the deep brain stimulation, and there are a lot of different frontiers with that. Um, with that said, I'll let you, leave you guys to ask more questions about that, but we are looking at many other different brain sites, not just the ones that we typically use for Parkinson's disease. So a lot of research is being done here. We're also starting to collect uh, brains from patients who've gotten uh, deep brain stimulation to see what's happening at the molecular level um, in these patients. So that could be an important question to answer um, and give us more clues to what's going on and how this therapy really works so we can make it even better. Um, and lastly, I want to talk a little bit about where my friend, uh, Dr. Chris Haas, and what he's doing in, in our group. You saw his, the gate rights trip. Well, he and his group actually work on the physiology and the kinetics of movement to help you guys uh, um, have better balance and prevent falls. This is him kind of putting on some of his machinery. Um, and they actually do this sort of gait analysis. And you saw sort of the, the example of the gate rights trip and what it does for us. I think this is going to be really critical in terms of how we help patients and follow patients um, along in our clinic. So we have these, um, no longer just have sort of a subjective view, we have some objective measures that we can look at um, to make patients get better. So putting all together, um, our approach here at the University of Florida, it's really a team approach. Uh, we're taking this from top down. Obviously, we are, there are us the doctors, but we have more people there. Our therapists play a huge role with PT, OT, and speech therapy. Um, our neuropsychiatry group here is first rate, probably the best around the country and even internationally. Um, our nursing group is wonderful. And then, of course, um, support care is really needed. Um, our social workers are here there for you as well. So it's really a team approach, and that's our new center up, front, up there. Um, and then lastly, really what I'm trying to emphasize here and kind of bridge the gap really is beyond medicine is our research that we're doing here um, as well as our outreach and teaching to you all about what we're doing. And hopefully we can answer questions about this later on this morning. Um, I will point out that we have now a new uh, CTRND or Center for Translational Research in Neurodegenerative Disease here at the University of Florida, brand new, just open. Um, I'm part of that center. Um, and there are numerous folks that work in there. It's headed by Dr. Todd Goldie. Uh, we have folks who are working on everything from Parkinson's disease to ALS to stroke and even Alzheimer's disease, um, looking at uh, different preclinical models and ways of looking at these disorders at a basic level, 
but really the overall goal is to translate what we're doing at the bench to bring it to you all, the patients. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to just stop and let you all, if you have any questions. Yes. Is this working? Very good. Can you tell us anything about possible use of stem cells in Parkinsonism? Yes, yes, I can briefly tell you that. I know that uh, Dr. Dennis Steinler was uh, going to be, it was, has been here before in past years and um, didn't make it this year, but we do have an active group that's looking at stem cell therapies. Um, it is an active area of research. Uh, we're still sort of a little bit at the infancy about stem cells. Uh, clearly there's some ethical reasons for with, regarding stem cell use and whether they're going to be useful. Uh, one thing, of course, we're heading towards are what are called induced pluripotent stem cells that actually come from skin cells. So researchers have been able to find a way to use molecular cues to take regular cells from your body to kind of make them go backwards in sort of their uh, differentiation, sort of de-differentiate them back to we call st usable stem cells. That kind of gets around the uh, problem in terms of getting things from embryos. Um, it's an exciting area, but still in its infancy, and um, it's really going to be currently most useful in looking at Parkinson's patients and these other Parkinsonism to understand what's going on in those disorders, so more basic research so far. Um, we're still working towards can we use them in patients to make people better. Um, we're getting there. Does that answer? Deep brain stimulation. The deep brain procedure. Deep brain stimulation. Yeah, I think we can take some questions regarding deep brain stimulation in our question and answer session and, and talk about that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for the question. You pass that forward. They just pass around. Are our children and grandchildren genetically predisposed if, if uh, one of their parents has Parkinson's? And if they are, is there any genetic testing that they could do? Um, so I hope all of you heard that. So do, uh, if you have a uh, relative, say like a first degree relative affected with Parkinson's disease, are your children and then grandchildren genetically predisposed to getting the disorder? Um, I will say that there is an increased chance Yes, but uh, um, that said, really, the chance of anyone getting Parkinson's is relatively low. So we're saying, I'll put it in this perspective, if you have a 1% lifetime chance, it might be like 2%. So there is an increase, but uh, keep that in perspective, what that increase really is. Um, that said, what I presented were actually we call familial forms that are inherited forms. When we're talking about genes and families, we're talking about what we call susceptibility genes. We, uh, there are no specific tests um, for what you're talking about. We do have specific tests for some of these uh, we call inherited forms of Parkinsonisms. If we think that there is a strong family history and often early onset Parkinson's disease, we will do uh, sometimes gene testing. We have uh, testing for at least three or four, possibly more of those specific genes. But those families are extremely rare. Familiar forms of Parkinsonism are less than 1% of what we see. Yes. Oh. Um, would help um, you with your research. So my, my question was about the government helping to remove obstacles that would expedite your research. Okay. And we know about stem cells, but uh, are there other things that the government maybe is yeah. in the way of that you'd like to see removed as a researcher? Uh, I, I guess I, I want to. I could give you some answer. That's a little loaded question for me. I, I, certainly, there are some obstacles uh, to help us out. Uh, clearly, stem cells was really one. I, I think the other real obstacle is getting grants these days. Um, and so uh, us as researchers spend a lot of time just writing those grants and, and getting them and then, you know, writing them again. So I think our, one of our biggest uh, 
you know, problems these days is spending 75 percent writing those grants and only 20 percent being able to work on them. And that's one of the big obstacles I think the government will, will be needing to work on and just how or the mechanism of getting those funds. Um, and of course we are working on other ways of getting, you know, getting funds to allow us to do research as well. And I will you know, have to give a sort of a thank you to those who are sort of providing uh, individual sort of unrestricted funds to us, both corporations as well as private individuals who are playing a bigger and bigger role in supporting research um, for, for us uh, where we can really do what we call sort of high risk, high yield experiments that are needed to really take those big steps um, forward, um, you know. What? Um, why don't we, because um, we need to move on, we're going to hold the questions for our question and answer session. We'll write, write your questions down 